So we are going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Hester and I'm a museum educator here at the Florida Museum. Uh, welcome to the Women Do Science panel with the Florida Museum. It's part of our celebration of International Women and Girls in Science Day. For a little housekeeping, this panel is being brought to you in a webinar format. So as you can see, you can see all of the panelists, but we can't see you and you guys are muted. Um, and at the end, we will have a question and answer session where I can unmute you so you can um, physically speak to the panelists. You can also drop any questions you have in the chat and I'll be monitoring that throughout the event and make sure that our moderators and our panelists get a hold of those questions as well. Also, um, we are offering closed captioning. So if you're interested, there's a little CC live transcript bot button at the bottom of your screen and you can um, click on that. These are auto-generated texts. So if anything looks a little wonky, I wanna go ahead and apologize in advance for that. For a little bit of history, in 2015, the United Nations selected February 11th as International Women and Girls in Science Day in order to further achieve gender equality and encourage more female participation in science. During today's webinar, you will get to hear the story from four women and their paths into science and the adventures along the way. Today's moderator will be Dr. Megan Ennis, the Assistant Curator of Museum Education for the Museum's Nat Natural History Department, her research currently focuses on examining factors that influence the science interests and career aspirations of underrepresented youth. Take it away, Megan. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today as we hear from some an amazing scientists about the work they do and how they got here. And what we are going to do is have each of our scientists share a little bit about themselves and their journey, and then we will have an opportunity for questions. And so first, we are going to start with Mallory Dimmitt, our Chief Executive Officer at the Florida Wildlife Corridor Coalition. So Mallory, take the way. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Give me one second here just to share my screen. Um, put up some slides. There you go. Um, so my name is Mallory Dimmitt. Thank you so much for that introduction, Megan. And yes, I work for the Florida Wildlife Corridor Coalition, now changing our name to Foundation. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that organization. Um, and also, just by way of background, I'm a lifelong conservationist and seventh generation Floridian. And so, you know, I'm really proud to share this state um, and this stage with so many amazing women and uh, sort of made it my lifelong passion to um, share Florida, wild Florida with others. So the mission of the organization that I lead is to champion a collaborative campaign to permanently connect, protect and restore the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And this map shows the wildlife corridor on the right. And you can see the lighter green areas um, are the areas we call opportunity areas for protection, not yet in any conservation status. Um, and the green, darker green areas are already in conservation status. So our organization focuses on the bottom there, you can see around using inspiration, education, and advocacy as the main ways that we uh, you know, work to elevate the corridor and um, advocate for its protection. And um, if you want to see a little bit closer view of what and where the Florida Wildlife Corridor is, you can see these same two layers again, um, and you can actually see Gainesville there. I like to say that the corridor is everyone's backyard. It stretches across the state of Florida, north, south, east, and west, and it actually covers about 18 million acres, or roughly half the land area of the state. Um, and for those two different zones, a little bit over 50% of it is already in some sort of conservation status or protected. And what we're working to do now is to protect as much as we can of the light green area. And that's really important because there are more than 100 places on this map where the corridor is already less than one mile wide, um, which threatens the total viability of the corridor. So. Um, uh, Florida Wildlife Corridor is really based on the goal of one contiguous connected landscape. And those bottlenecks are the places that sort of threaten that um, contiguity or the connectedness um, of the habitat. So it is at risk at a number of places. All told, this 18 million acres represents the best remaining natural areas in the state of Florida. That's essential not only for wildlife, but for a lot of the ecosystem services that are found and provided by uh, natural areas, including water filtration, 
our source water, our drinking water, storm resiliency, carbon sequestration, and all manner of science that we're starting to understand now uh, that's actually provided by this um, green infrastructure in Florida and the sort of backbone of the state. So I mentioned that we raise awareness for this effort through inspiration. And one of the ways that we do that is by um, trekking across the state of Florida. I've had the honor and um, the good fortune to be able to participate and co-lead five different treks across the state of Florida, including two 100 day, uh, 1000 mile treks. So in 10 years ago, we did our first trek from the Everglades um, to the Okefenokee crossing a thousand miles in hundred days. And then a couple of years later, did another thousand mile trek in 70 days. And our method lately has been to do these shorter treks that you can see in the various colors here, um, 2018, 2019. And our most recent trek was in 2021. And we actually invited three teen trekkers to join us for that one. And later in this program, you're gonna get to see the trailer for an upcoming film about that trek. So these shorter expeditions allow us to draw attention to the places that are most at risk within the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Um, and of course, you know, a, a thousand mile trek takes a whole lot of time, energy and planning, but the, the shorter ones are, are a little bit more accessible. So I ask you all to stay tuned as we plan our next um, expedition for this coming fall. Each one of those treks, um, is shared to the public. Not only can you follow along on social media about where we are every day and what we're doing as we're moving along, um, and we do lots of public outreach and media, but we also work to turn those into films that will sort of live evergreen after the expedition is, is gone and can be easily shared. And so this shows you a couple of, couple of the previous films from our previous treks, um, and you can find them all on the website of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. There's a page dedicated to our films. We also do advocacy work. And so to advocate for the protection of the Florida Wildlife Corridor is um, you know, a big part of the, of the mission. And last year we had the success of passing the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act, um, which we're very excited about. It's the first time that um, in-state statute is recognized the geography of the Florida Wildlife Corridor and provides a um, clear and connected conservation vision um, for protecting the corridor, it encourages of the agencies and um, to work together with landowners to bring the remaining acres into protection. A big part of that also came with um, additional funding to do the land and water protection work of the corridor. Last year, there was $400 million and our goal is to keep that level of funding going um, in future years. So obviously the funding, the land acquisition funding is critical to the ultimate success of being able to protect the corridor. So uh, what comes next for us? Well. One is just to um, do the work of implementing the act, essentially accelerating the pace of conservation to achieve all those opportunity areas and to try to conserve as many as we can as quickly as we can. And then to continue the inspiration work as well. Um, we're trying to build a, a movement of people who care about the Florida Wildlife Corridor and want to see it protected. And I think that's where you all come into play. You know, we'd love to have you follow along and, and join our cause. Um, you can see the full film of Home Waters later um, in the month of March. And also there's a short 30 minute film called Saving the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is actually um, screening now in the Tampa Bay area, WEDU, but will be rolling out to all Florida PBS stations um, sometime this spring. So please keep your eyes out for that. And we're also launching a brand campaign called Live Wildly to help bring and, um, you know, socialize this idea of that all things we do can be connected to the Florida Wildlife Corridor and the need to protect it around our state. So we're very excited about that. The social media and the website will be launching actually this coming week, I think on Thursday. Um, and you'll start to see advertising for Live Wildly throughout the year. So um, that's, that's everything for me. And thank you so much for including me on this panel. Mallory, thank you so much for sharing all of that. That seems really exciting. And we have shared the link to some of those videos in the chat. So make sure you grab those before you leave the webinar today. Next, we have Dr. Jenny Adler. She is a conservation photographer and underwater photojournalist. So Jenny, we're excited to learn about the work you've been doing. Thanks so much, Megan. Really appreciate it. Congrats, Mallory, on Live Wildly launching. That's so exciting. Uh, so I'm going to also share my screen with you guys. 
because I'm a photojournalist and what would I do without pictures, right? So I'm actually originally trained as a marine biologist and I did my PhD at UF studying freshwater ecology in the springs. And over the past 10 years have been documenting Florida's freshwater springs. And I originally started out researching them and over time kind of started to realize that there were so many stories that were being told or so, so much science being happening but not of stories being told about the science. So after I finished my PhD, I went in to communicate science using imagery and National Geographic a couple of years ago asked what the greatest hurdle I had overcome. And I didn't feel like I had had any, you know, huge life hurdles, but I, I said that I felt at first, like I quit my sci uh, science after doing my PhD. And this actually resonated with so many more people than I thought it would resonate with and kind of got so many replies about people saying the exact same thing. And I think what this made me understand is that communication is this essential part of science, but it's not always seen that way and not always valued in the same way that science is. So now what I do is I'm able to understand the science, communicate with scientists, and then take their studies and what their knowledge and help bring it to the public in a way that is maybe beautiful, inspiring, or um, inspires people to ask more questions about what's going on. And this is an example, this is a dye trace study happening at Silver Spring a couple of years ago. And you can see the PI, uh, Dr. Nathan Reaver, diving down there, who's in David Kaplan's lab at uh, University of Florida. And this is a very complex hydrological study that happens either right at sunrise or right at sunset. So very few people will ever see this, but by bring, um, creating images, we can uh, involve more people in the pages outside the pages of a peer reviewed journal. So one thing that I do with my images is, you know, show these beautiful creatures such as manatees that live in our freshwater springs. So the more than 1000 springs that dot the landscape of Florida are you know, home to in manatees and these other incredible creatures. They also supply more than 90% of our drinking water. And what made me really start documenting and researching these ecosystems at first, you know, while, while working as a scientist was that, as you can see here, manatees eat grass and there's algae all over the bottom of this spring. And most of the springs in Florida have transitioned from this, these beautiful flowing green meadows of grasses to, you know, kind of what they call this, scientists call this nuisance algae. And so I was studying this transition from grasses to algae and you know how it impacts the ecosystems, but also how we're communicating it and what the public really knows about this. So besides being an incredible place, um, an ecosystem for you know things like manatees, fish, turtles, things like that, springs are also a perfect place to cool off during the really hot summers that we we have here in Florida. And so this is a photo I took during a camp uh, summer camp a couple of years ago, and during grad school I really started thinking about how the kids in Florida were growing up. Are, were they going to the springs? What were they learning about these places where their drinking water comes from? How are they connected to these ecosystems from a young age? And I realized that a lot of kids living in Gainesville hadn't been to a spring. So as part of um, my research, I brought the students out to the springs and actually gave them cameras. Taking pictures and sharing them is, is one way to tell stories, but it's really important that we think about who is telling these stories and who has a voice in the stories. And for these kids, it was just such a different experience for them to be able to jump in and take their own pictures. And these are some examples of the pictures they took. Um, the turtles were kind of the star of the show, uh, but they realized in the written pre and post test that I did, the springs became less of a pool of water and more of an ecosystem and something as they saw as a, a living, yeah, a living ecosystem where, you know, the turtle is eating the hydrilla and it's swimming around and, you know, you can see this little fish up on the top left that's called a hog choker. It looks like a flounder. It's not related, but they got to see these, these really cool pieces of the spring that they, you would never see from, from looking in from above. So I actually work to tell stories, not just in Gainesville and Florida, which is really important to me, but also all over the world. And a lot of these stories, I try to focus on women. And this is Nasiri. She is one of 11 sponge farmers on the east coast of Zanzibar, an island off of Tanzania. And she and 10 other women own their own sponge farms and sell the sponges. And they can make up to 30 times more than seaweed farmers on the island. So they're a really profitable crop. And 
one thing with this story is it is a story about sponges, but it's really a story about these incredible women who have not only who learned to swim, but also learned to farm sponges and understand, you know, the science of, of how to grow them in a way that is profitable. So these stories are about science, but they're also about people. One thing I've been working on over the past couple of years is a grant through AAAS. And I wanted to, you know, bring people photos of women in science, but I also wanted students to be able to experience what it's like to be a scientist working underwater. So I made two 360 videos that are focused on um, two different women doing underwater field work. And they're both available on my uh, YouTube channel. If you just Google my name and um, YouTube, there are the only two videos that are on there right now. And this video specifically was off there um, in Florida off of Riviera Beach. And this is Dr. Chelsea Bennis releasing a long arm octopus and she's actually releasing it onto the camera. So when you watch the footage, you can um, see the octopus up close. And then I brought the videos to schools in Kentucky so that students could really immerse themselves in the ocean even though they're very far from it to see what it's like to swim in the water uh, with, with a scientist. It was really rewarding to see how excited they were about it and really amazing to work with the teachers at this school who were amazing and ended up writing curriculum that, um, you know, embedded these, these videos in, into the actual standards for their grade levels. And the last thing I want to briefly talk about um, and show you guys the trailer for is Home Water. So I feel super lucky to have worked on um, directing the Home Waters film with my partner Ian as the director of photography and we made uh, this, uh, it's gonna be a 15 minute film about these three girls that Mallory mentioned, high school age girls who did the 50 mile trek from the Rainbow River Head Spring out to the Gulf of Mexico. And these girls are just inspiring in so many ways. And I'm really excited to share their story with you. This is a small um, behind the scenes frame of filming the girls in a little spring run near Rainbow. It had got a little bit deeper than we were expecting, but it was just a, an incredible three days of documenting them going through these really wild parts of Florida and their backyard that many of them had uh, never been to. So I think Gabby has been kind enough to share the trailer. So I will stop sharing my screen with you guys. If I can figure out how. <laughs> there we go. This is the first time I've been like out in like the actual wilderness in a while. It's beginning to feel more like a home to me, honestly. Close my eyes in the middle of a city night. Close my eyes and I'm underneath the southern lights. Close my eyes and my heart. Hi, my name is Ava. Hi, I'm Erin. I'm Mallory and I've lived in Florida my whole life. And I haven't been to a lot of the places we've gone this week. Close my eyes and I'm halfway home. Take me home. It really doesn't change your mindset until you're out experiencing it because it really changes your perspective on things. Back to the place where I belong. I want to be a role model to a few other kids and inspire people to actually get out of their houses, go explore, and try to protect all of our nature that we have left. Take me home. The entire point of conserving the Florida Wildlife Corridor is for the next generation. Once you've immersed yourself into these places and taken that journey, you're gonna share that story for the rest of your life. These waters really just mean a, a home. It just makes me happy to be out there. Take me back home. Thanks, Gabby. Thank you. Sorry, Jenny, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying thank you to Gabby. And just one thing about think, when we think about who tells the story, one thing we were very specific about with the trailer and the film is having the girls tell their own story. So it has created some challenges in terms of trying to stitch together all the audio and have them talk about even like the science and conservation parts. But it's been really amazing to see how well they did with, you know, understanding what the Florida Wildlife Corridor is and helping um, tell everyone the story in their own voices. Well, thank you so much. And we really look forward to seeing the full film. Um, Jenny, can you tell us again when we might expect to see that? 
Yeah. So the full film will be ready at the end of March. And I think there'll be some showings around the Tampa area, Tampa St. Pete area around that time. Um, but we're happy to keep everyone updated as we get the official dates for those. It will also be in film festivals. So it won't be posted online at that time, probably. But um, yeah, it'll be available in a little more than a month. Well, congratulations. That looks like an amazing experience. And we really look forward to seeing the full film. Thank you for sharing the trailer with us today. Thanks, so next man. we have Maria Cortez. Um, she is a doctoral candidate at the Florida Museum and works in the Laboratory of Molecular Systematics and Evolutionary Genetics. So Maria. Hello everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today. Can you hear me? All right. So I'm also going to share my screen. Okay. One second. Can you see presentation mode? Okay, awesome. So as you can see from the photo, I was born and raised in Brazil. And when I was a little kid, I did not wanna be a scientist. What I wanted to be was a ballerina. And for a long time, that's what you know I invested my time in. But my mom was also very, um, you know, you have to do well in school. My mom was a teacher and she would always keep an eye out on our grades and make sure we studied hard. And I also liked to study, so I did well in school. And then I got into college and I fell in love with plants. And it kind of sounds a little cheesy, but I, that is the truth. I did fall in love with plants. And I will show you who made me fall in love with plants this amazing lady that was um, my professor in college. And she talked about plants as if they were the most amazing things on earth. And obviously they are. So I immediately fell in love with them. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe I can find some space in my life from, for something other than dancing. So instead of dancing on stages, I began dancing on, you know, forests and other areas with plants and having fun and learning how to love them. So I went to very beautiful places for research to get to know more more about plants. And I got to, to work with, in areas that are amazing in my home country. But not all of that is not all of science uh, when you work with plants is about going to the field. There is a lot that involves working, you know, long hours in front of your computer or writing. Um, you also spend hours in conferences and explaining your work to other people, to other scientists, or to people that are not involved in science, but that is as important as talking to other scientists about our work. And you also spend hours prepping a classroom to teach. And that is extremely exciting and satisfactory. I love teaching and I'm really excited about a part of my work. And right now, what I'm doing is that I'm investigating an area in Brazil. So as you can see in this map, there is an area in black and that area is a vegetation type called Campos Supestris. So imagine an area that has a lot of rocks, a lot of grassy uh, plants, but also these other amazing plants that you can see on your screen. So you have beautiful flowers as well. There's over 5,000 uh, flower species uh, in this area. So it's a really incredible area. And I'm trying to understand all this plant diversity but I'm also trying to understand the cultural diversity in this area. So how people in this area live with the plants, what they do with the plants, how they take care of the plants. And I have an amazing collaborator there that's called Nancy. And she's this lady that you can see in the right side of your screen. And she's amazing and she knows a lot about the plants in the area. So she has a lot of traditional ecological knowledge and it's really important for science to bridge with traditional ecological knowledge so we can all be on the same page and learn from each other. But before I leave, before we move on, I just wanted to acknowledge that 
you know, it really takes a village to get there. And this village is most of the time filled with very special, important ladies. So all these ladies you see uh, on your screen are women in Brazil that have helped me throughout my college years and through my masters. And there's my mom all, uh, there as well that she helped me during field work. And then once I moved to the US, I met even more amazing women that are scientists and that inspire me and help me to get through the many challenges that we face. So I really tell you scientists can be whatever they want. They can dance, they can have children, they can have fun. Um, but the important thing is that we do this together and that we support each other, especially us ladies, we need to be there for each other. So find your, if you wanna be a scientist, find your community, find a place where you're gonna feel loved and accepted and you're gonna have fun doing your work. So here's a little cactus just sharing love with you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. That is such an important message about the community that we all have as scientists and how a community of women engaging in research can really make a difference um, in your experience as a scientist. And I just loved the diversity of people you shared and the importance of collaborating with the communities where you are doing your work. So thank you so much for sharing that aspect of your work, Maria. And next we have Gabby Salazar. Gabby is a doctoral candidate in the School of Forestry, Fisheries and Geomatic Sciences and co-author of No Boundaries. Oh, it's not gonna show, ah, maybe, there we go. No Boundaries, 25 Women Explorers and Scientists Share Adventures, Inspiration and Science. Gabby, thank you so much for being here today and take it away. Wonderful, thank you. Wow, those were wonderful presentations and really show, I think, um, like we wanted to with the book, just how many different ways people can be involved in science. And so I will just tell you a little bit about my background and what I do. Um, so I have had kind of, Ginny and I were talking about this earlier today, actually, uh, that we have kind of opposite paths. She started in the PhD program and doing scientific research and ecology and then transitioned into photojournalism and storytelling. And I kind of took the opposite direction. And we think that there's, you know, incredible value in both. And so I'm gonna walk, walk you through that. This is me um, out in the rainforest of Peru um, on my first kind of photography, big photography expedition right after I graduated from college. Um, and it's one of my favorite field memories. Um, I spent almost 10 months living in Peru at the time. And I'd always been fascinated by nature and wildlife and also by taking photos. Um, this is kind of where I started. I actually started photography when I was really young. I was 11 years old. It was back in the time of film cameras. So I did not have a digital camera at the time. Uh, and most of my photos were taken very near my backyard in North Carolina. My family didn't travel internationally and to far off, far flung places for vacation. So I concentrated on getting to know kind of the insects and the birds and the patterns and the beauty in nature right near where I grew up. And that was a wonderful way for me to start becoming curious about nature and natural history and photography. And this image over here to the left is one of the first ones I actually won a photo competition with. Um, a, a national photo competition that ended up in the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And I took it just about a mile from my house in a, in a sunflower field. And so I think it's a real good lesson that you don't have to go far to kind of make exciting, you know, little discoveries. But for me, photography started as this love of nature, and then it quickly transitioned to kind of a, a mission-driven discipline. So as I took more photos and I traveled around the world, I got to see, you know, not only the beauty, but also some challenges that the environment faces. And that's when I started kind of transitioning around the time I went to college into being a conservation photographer. And to me, conservation photography is all about kind of documenting environmental issues 
the beauty and the you know challenges, and also trying to think about storytelling and telling you know, what are the potential solutions to these issues. So it's not just looking at one aspect, it's kind of telling the whole complex story. And so, you know, this is a, a project I worked on in the Caribbean, looking at um, uh, parrots that were involved in uh, the wildlife trade. And so those are the types of stories that I started telling. As I started getting into that, I also started doing a lot more science communication. And so not only was I telling environmental stories, but I was starting to work and collaborate with scientists um, like this woman here, who's also in the book. Her name is Dr. Stephanie Grokey, and she's a volcanologist. So she studies volcanoes. I mean, who knew you could do that? What a cool job. And she called me and said, hey, do you want to come, you know, photograph this expedition uh, to study active lava domes in Guatemala? And, you know, I said, well, that's not what I typically do. It's typically birds, but, you know, I can, <laughs> I can expand my horizons. And so we went on this, you know, incredible expedition and we're camping here on the top of a giant mountain. And there's an active lava dome below that's erupting every six to eight hours, which was probably the wildest place I've ever camped. But I got really interested in this idea of helping scientists tell their stories. Now, along the way, I also got interested in understanding and asking my own questions, my own, and, and conducting my own research. And so, um, you know, I started going back to school. So I, I realized that I had these questions, I couldn't find the answers for them. So maybe I needed to go and do the research myself. And so I had actually collaborated with the Florida Museum last year on um, uh, a project for my doctoral dissertation that looks at some big questions about um, images and how photographic images influence our attitudes and our behaviors related to environmental problems. And so this is an experiment that we did where we actually had two photo exhibits in the museum, a positive exhibit about marine life and the oceans that shows all these beautiful images of nature and a matched exhibit of the same species. You can see here a whale shark with a plastic bag um, these images are the negative images that are impacted by plastics. And we actually observed this exhibit for almost these exhibits for six weeks and measured how many people made donations um, when seeing each exhibit to, to ocean conservation and made pledges to change their personal use of plastics. So really my interest in this research grew out of my interest in, in, in photography. And I also do research on environmental education because I'm interested in how some of the you know, programs that we create in museums or in um, environmental education uh, organizations, how do they influence people's attitudes and behaviors? And can we be um, you know, more effective in the way we design those programs? And so this has all led me to, <laughs> you know, I think, I think a kind of interesting career. And I wanted to tell you about those transitions. I mean, it's all condensed. I'm 34 years old, right? I started photography when I was 11. So there've been a lot of kind of moments in between those big highlights. But I think when I was a kid, I thought that life would be very linear. Like I would decide I was going to be a firefighter and like I would just do all the steps and then I would become a firefighter and then I would be a firefighter for life. And for me, curiosity is this underlying force that has driven all of these different decisions, right? From being a photographer to being a conservation photographer and then to being science communicator and now to being a researcher. And because, I mean, I think because life <laughs> turned out differently than I expected and in, in the most wonderful way, um, I worked with Claire Fiesler, uh, my co-author, who is also, she's actually studies marine biology. And we created this, um, this book that just came out on February 1st. And it features and profiles 25 women scientists from around the world and tries to tell these different stories uh, about the experiences of women in science and to really kind of think about, you know, like um, Maria was talking about, you know, what is the importance of female friendships and mentors in science? You know, is science, when I was a kid, I thought scientists worked alone in a lab all the time. And we, really, we have stories in this book about how science is really collaborative, right? And so anyway, we're really excited about this. It's for um, 10 to 14 year olds, although we've been hearing from eight year olds and 40 year olds that they're enjoying it. So I think it has a range of, you know, range of a potential audience. And not only does it tell these really amazing stories, 
but we also wanted it to be kind of a yearbook of potential careers. So there's also features women from 25 different fields so that you can just see and kids can see that there are so many different ways to contribute to science and exploration because research shows that we have a pretty limited idea of what counts as a STEM career. And I think I love hearing from Mallory and Jenny today because I think both of their kind of careers and roles in science and exploration show that there are just so many different ways that you can contribute. So I know we have some questions and I'll stop sharing. Gabby, thank you so much. And I think that is also a really important thing to think about that um, for a lot of people in science, it wasn't a straight shot and that we didn't start our lives as uh, young children saying, I want to be a scientist. Um, and we come to it from very different ways. So thank you for sharing. And your last comment there, Gabby, actually um, brings up a question that was in the chat, wanting to know a little bit more about um, Jenny and Mallory's background and how they got involved in making the film and what else you're working on. So um, Jenny, do you wanna start? Yeah, sure. So um, like I mentioned, I'm actually originally trained as a marine biologist and then an ecologist, but there was so much science happening that wasn't getting communicated. And I wanted to understand how I could use my camera to tell those stories. And I really mostly started out doing photojournalism, but have gotten into video over the past couple of years, because a lot of times on assignments, editors will be like, oh, can you just get some video to go with that? Which is a little bit ridiculous because you're trying to shoot a story and do video at the same time. But having worked with the Florida like with the Springs for the past 10 years, they were working on a Florida Wildlife Corridor asked, you know, about directing this film focused on how kind of water connects the corridor. So the girls are kind of paddling this whole 50 miles mostly. And I never directed a film before. And so this is another another good lesson. But I, I knew that I had the skills to do it. And I knew that I had the understanding of the ecosystem. So I wasn't blindly jumping into it, but understanding that, you know, I have the skills in the background to do it. And I said, okay, let, let's do it. And so I think it's also like giving yourself that credit and believing in yourself enough to know that you can do something new and different because maybe you have the skills, maybe you weren't trained exactly as like the previous director was, but thinking about how you can bring your unique skill set to a project and it has been really rewarding. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Mallory, how about you? Can you share a little more about your background and um, what drove you into this project as well? Sure. Yeah. So I have a master's degree in environmental economics and policy, and I've always focused my conservation work um, on protecting rivers and riparian areas and then large landscape conservation. So um, I started working with the Florida Wildlife Corridor team, you know, over 10 years ago, really about Earth Day 2010. And we had this need to get people to care about this landscape that we were trying to protect that we call hiding in plain sight. Um, it, it runs down the middle of Florida, but not everyone is aware of it and, and certainly not the need to protect it. So that's when we started the thought of using expeditions. Um, we traveled them on foot or by bicycle or by kayak in these places. We could tell the stories of the people we met along the way who were the landowners or the property managers or the caretakers the stewards of the Florida Wildlife Corridor and the people who depended on um, those lands for their livelihood um, or, you know, were working to protect them. And so at the beginning, we thought of ourselves really as kind of translators, as, if you will, where, um, you know, we gave other people voices. And I think in our later films, we start to use our own voice even more, realizing that there's power in just seeing it kind of through our eyes and um, maybe maybe in our conversation with others. Um, so this film in particular, I think was Im important transition from the original three trekkers. So I always, I always went with two other um, fellow conservation trekkers, uh, a photographer named Carlson Moore Jr. and a bear biologist named Joe Guthrie. Been all on all the treks together and I was always the only female. And in this trek, you know, we, we were very intentional about the beginning of wanting it to um, feature um, a female-led track, have a female filmmaker and Jenny, and um, include uh, our teen participants. And we also wanted to make the link back to the original trekkers in our earlier trek. So Carlson and Joe and I showed up more uh, later into the experience to get to share that time um, 
and the experience with the with the girls. Wonderful. Thank you, Mallory, so much. And Maria, as we are talking about, you know, what drove you all to these, um, you know, thinking about how you really wanted to be a ballerina. Um, can you tell us about a moment of wonder or awe that really just helped you to see plants as this path that you wanted to take, uh, dancing away from your original plan? Sure. Yeah, I can think of many moments, but I think the first one was really what I was describing when I was in college and this professor just, you know, she would talk about plants as if as if they were her child, you know, like you could see the love in her while she was talking about them and she would answer any of the questions in a very like open way. She would take the time to talk with us about it and and that to me was like very impressive because especially when you are in college, there are a lot of um, moments where, you know, because sometimes instructors have to, you know, do research and, and are worried about multiple things at the same time, sometimes they don't have as much time to put into teaching. And, and that is a little frustrating as a student um but to me that was like incredible how much time she put into that and how much she cared and then i remember once i went to one of the areas where i study in brazil and it's a very remote area where they have a very specific plant that only occurs there there and it looks like it's jurassic park because it's like you walk into this place and you're like oh my god where am i and on these like huge plants, you have an amazing rare species of orchid that's like blood red. And I was just like, this is incredible. And I am so lucky. I am so lucky and privileged that I can be here and I can spend time like understanding uh, this area and these plants. So that was another like kind of wow moment to me. Um, and then the last moment I can think of was when I went into the Everglades, but actually into the swamp. <laughs> and I was, I'm never doing that again, <laughs> by the way, but <laughs> cause I'm super scared of everything, but it was also like an amazing moment because the swamp is just beautiful. And I couldn't believe I was there. Thank you so much, Maria. And that just really speaks to the importance of role models, which you all now, get to do for the next generation of women and girls who may have an interest in science. So it just is really important. And yeah, Amy, that that is also good to know that becoming a scientist doesn't automatically mean you're no longer afraid of alligators and spiders and things that go bump in the swamp. Gabby, we have a question for you on the issue of plastics, and this is from Dee Ellison, um, and especially plastics in the ocean, which seems really overwhelming. And do you know of any projects or options where um, individuals can have an impact on that problem? That's a great question. Um, there are some wonderful organizations that are doing work on this issue. I really admire a lot of the work that the Ocean Conservancy does. Um, and that's a big organization, uh, but they do a lot of great work on organizing like long-term cleanups and crews. Um, there's also some really, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, discarded fishing nets in our ocean that make up a lot of plastic pollution. There are some wonderful organizations that are, um, and I don't have the names of them off the top of my head, but I can certainly send a link. Um, they are uh, actually working with the companies that they're working with companies to like create cleanups so that then they can recycle the fishing nets and make other materials and other like commercial items out of them. And so I think there are some good companies. If you look up, you know, things made out of recycled plastics, any, any kind of companies that we can support that are helping to kind of create a supply chain that utilizes these plastics and keeps them out of the ocean are good. Um, I've also heard good things about Four Ocean, which is another organization that is, is doing a lot of plastics and I believe is based in Florida. Um, so there's, there's a lot of groups that are working on this. I think the thing is, it is overwhelming. A lot of these issues are overwhelming, but if we all kind of work in our communities, and that can include like picking up not just plastic on the beach, but picking it up in freshwater waterways and making sure it doesn't get to the ocean in the first place. 
um, you know, if we all did that in our own communities, I think we could we could make a, a pretty big impact. So. Thank you, Gabby. Did um, Jenny or Mallory, did either of you have anything you'd like to contribute to that? I'll just add that on the last day of that trek, the girls participated in a ghost trap rodeo organized by Ocean Aid 360. And I put their link um, in the chat and who does this type of cleaning up of derelict fishing, um, you know, things in, that are in the ocean and in our bays and estuaries in Florida specifically. And so it was a great chance for them to partake in that and, and really have it be the sort of service project and the giving back part of the expedition. Thank you, Mallory. And, you know, something else to consider is also how do we reduce plastics in our everyday life and um, making sure that we are making choices in the things we purchase and the things we use so that they're not getting to the ocean and we don't have to clean them up in the first place. So that's another avenue to think about and something that we can easily do in our everyday lives. Um, so a question that we had was, you know, thinking about how being a woman in science and technology, engineering or math is not always easy. So I was wondering if um, each of our panelists would just share a challenge that you have faced over the course of your career and how did you overcome it and, you know, how did it change things for you? So Jenny, do you want to go first? Or, or you don't have to, sorry to throw you on the spot there. No, that's okay. I was just trying to think. Um, I mean, I think in some ways it's challenging. And I think when I got asked that question by National Geographic about like what your biggest hurdle was, I think that like being a woman actually wasn't the biggest hurdle for me. It was more like myself in my own way, thinking that I had kind of quit science. Like I said, after I did you know, grad school, I think everybody kind of assumes that you're going to go on to a specific role after that. And I didn't. So I was kind of, well, I'm a woman, I was getting in my own way, I guess, <laughs> um, sort of like having expectations for yourself, you know, but I just, I really loved, I asked Mallory this uh, during the interviews for the, um, for the film. And I just loved her response. I was like, what was it like being the only woman on the expedition? And I think we have this assumption that it like always makes it more difficult, which sometimes it does. But she was like, honestly, a lot of people ask me this question and I don't, and they feel like it was brave or inspiring, but she's like, I didn't think twice about it. And I was just like, yeah, actually that that's really cool. And so I think like, for me, I just feel really grateful for all of the incredible women that came before me. Like I felt like I could always look up to like Sylvia Earle and, you know, all these incredible women in um, science before me. And I think that they kind of really helped blaze a path that I'm really grateful for because it did make it easier for me in a lot of ways that I think like I didn't appreciate until I saw how difficult it was for them. Thank you so much, Jenny. Anybody else want to think on that question or share a story that came to mind? I'll share a story. Um, so I, after college, started working for the Nature Conservancy in Colorado, and I started as an intern and worked my way up in the Nature Conservancy, um, working on river basins in the western U.S. Um, and the Intermountain West. And I think as I moved up, I came to certain places in my career where I did have difficult spots deciding, you know, what I was going to do next. And so, um, whether it was, I felt like I was learning so much on the job, but, and I took eight years between college and going back to grad school. Um, so one of those times was just figuring out, you know, is this right for me um, to, should I try and go to school while I'm working? Should I, you know, leave my work in order to go to school? And I just sought the wise counsel of others. So I really value, you know, having mentors and reaching out to them when you're, you um, when you're asking yourself those difficult questions. And a similar one for me was about, do I continue in this landscape that I've learned so much about and I love, or do I come back to Florida where I'm from and have a real connection to in order to try to give back to this state? And so ultimately I made that decision eight years ago and I've never looked back. You know, it's been a great, it's been a great transition for me, but it didn't come easily. So I, I just throw that out there in case that helps other people on their journey. Thank you, Mallory. Gabby or Maria? I can go ahead and share something um, that's very personal because um, I am Latin American and I have a culture that's very different than the culture here. And I've sensed a few times 
uh, that people were, um, especially men, um, bothered by the way I speak or because I'm loud or because I like to communicate and I like to hug my friends and this in like in the what used to be the scientific setting of you know white old men uh it's it's kind of changing it's not like this anymore and some people have a hard time uh, opening up to that and and this is a challenge for me and it's a challenge for many other of my friends that have different cultures that hold different identities here and that go through this kind of like it's not necessarily something that someone tells you sometimes but it is how they look at you or the way that they don't direct what they're talking to you but to someone else um so this can be a challenge depending on the identity you hold um but i do think there is a lot of movement especially in recent years to try and open up science and make it a, a truly more um inclusive place so i think that that is that can be um an issue and as women in general this can be an issue as well so yeah thank you maria gabby did you have anything you wanted to share yeah i think Overall, I think I'll echo a lot of the sentiments, which is that like having strong friendships and mentors has been a huge part of why I'm still here um, in science, because um, it's just so wonderful to have a network of people. And I encourage um, anybody who's interested in science to form that network, just like Maria said. You know, I've certainly encountered, you know, I think we all have imposter syndrome sometimes, right? Especially in graduate school. That's a big thing we talk about a lot. I hadn't really heard that until I got to graduate school that much as a term, but in, in, in school, you think about, you know, oh, am I really meant to be here? Am I smart enough? Am I, you know, am I able to do this? Can I contribute to science, like to knowledge of our world? Like that's a big kind of self-questioning, especially when you're around all these other people who seem so put together and confident. And I think for me, you know, that has of course been a challenge. And I think it is for a lot of people um, and I think being able to talk openly about that, and, and we do in graduate school, really helps overcome it. I don't know if that's so much being a woman, but just I think being a person, I think it's good for kids to understand that it's, it's a real thing. And even people who seem like they have it all together sometimes go home and say, I don't know if what I said today in that meeting made any sense at all. <laughs> and I, you know, that's just a part of a part of growing and learning. Thank you so much, Gabby. And that is so important to think about that, you know, how so many people seem like they have it all together, but that probably almost all of us struggle from time to time with whether we're really doing the best we can and are we making a difference? And clearly you are all doing an amazing job with that. So we have a question um, from Christina about where do you recommend someone who wants to pursue a graduate degree to work on protecting biodiversity start in order to know what area to even study? Anybody have any thoughts on that question? I'll, I'll just offer that I started out in an internship, as I said, and I think internships are a good way to get um, a lot of experience in a short amount of time and test or sort of try on the, the areas you think you might be interested in. So, um, you know, they, I, I never feel like you have anything to lose by pursuing an internship, whether that's for 12 weeks or shorter or longer, it gives you a chance to, I think, get into the real work of it to meet a number of people in that organization and who they interface with and figure out if that's the, you know, if, you, if the work done is actually what you thought it was going to be like or not, right? Which is um, just a good way to get to almost try it on. And I'll add that I think we need all types of skill sets in biodiversity conservation. And so I think I would recommend thinking about what else you might be interested in or feel like you have natural skills in in addition to being interested in conservation. So you can be an engineer and contribute to conservation. You can be a development professional who does fundraising and contribute to conservation. And so it doesn't have to come from a, you know, in the lab or in the field, collecting data, doing scientific research perspective. Like there are just so many different ways. 
um, that we can we can contribute our skill sets to helping the environment. Maria or Jenny, any thoughts on that one? All right, well, since we have just a few minutes left, um, the last question I wanna ask is what advice do you have for parents who want to encourage their children to take an interest in STEM or STEAM? Because art is so important as we've seen through all of your talks today. I credit my parents all the time for, I think, cultivating this interest. And so I think as parents, you know, the first role that you are doing is really helping um, expose and shape your children's interests in an, an all number of things. But so for me, when I look back to those sort of first moments where I knew I wanted to work in the field of conservation, I didn't even know what that was at the time, but I knew that I, with my parents, got to go to amazing places around the state and um, we actually went on a lot of field trips with the Nature Conservancy, we went to state parks, and I remember in middle school or high school talking with someone, and it kind of was the first time it clicked with me that that was their job, and they got to do this as a job, and, you know, I was going into college and starting to get at the asked questions about what you wanted to major in, and that's where I decided that environmental science was, you know, the path for me is that I really started to understand what, um, you know, people do for a living just from the places that I had visited um, or the experiences I had thanks to my parents taking me out in the field and um, around to many different parts of just the environment. And that's not open to everyone, but for me, it made a huge difference in, in my early life. I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jenny. R real quick, I was just, I was just gonna say, um, accept and participate. Uh, and I'll give a shout out to my mom who is here today. So see, <laughs> that's the one way you can participate. Um, so shout out to my mom. Love you, mom. That's so sweet. I know mom's mom is out there too. Hi, mom. <laughs> all the, we were joking that all the moms are going to make um, Gabby and Claire's book a bestseller because they're all buying them and giving to everyone they know. So yeah, your mom's <laughs> they're always going to be supporting, which is great. And I think it's kind of maybe we can reframe how we talk to kids about what they want to be when they grow up because I think you there's a lot of like stress on that question but maybe just begin by asking them what they're curious about and kind of supporting that curiosity because when they ask what you want to be it kind of makes it seem like that one thing is what defines you and I think that you can be so many things at once including being a scientist and um, I know like I'm really grateful for my parents support even when they're like like, what do you like, even though I don't have a traditional job, you know, like I'm a freelancer and work for all different types of organizations. And um, I really credit them. I mean, they taught me to sail, swim, you know, be comfortable in the water and kind of have these other skills. It's like, even if you're not training me to be a scientist specifically, you're giving me like the skill set and the confidence that I need um, to, you know, go be uh, what I want to be and kind of make, make design a career for myself. So yeah, I'm really grateful for that. And I'll just add one of the big themes that came out of the 25 interviews we did for the book is that a lot of the women had no idea that they could be what they ended up being when they started out, right? It was like coming to a lecture like this and realizing you could be like Maria or like it was, you know, being exposed to a lecture on volcanoes in college and suddenly realizing that that was a possibility. And so I think the more that you can expand the range of possibilities in a kid's mind, it, and the more you can provide relatable role models, the, the more likely they are to want to pursue these types of careers or hobbies. It doesn't even have to be a career. And just to bring this all together, my research shows you don't have to be an expert in any of this to get your kids interested. So, you know, take the time, learn with them and there are wonderful ways to engage that doesn't that don't require you to be an outside explorer or a scientist or a researcher, um, but that you as a family can learn about these different kinds of careers and opportunities. So thank you all so much 
to our panelists and to Amy for helping to coordinate and Alberto at the museum for keeping things running there. Um, as Amy has put in the chat, Gabby will be visiting the museum shortly to help um, sign some books if you're interested. I believe Maria will be there at a table talking about her research if you'd like to get to know her a little bit more. And we look forward to having you all again at our next seminar. Thank you all so much. Oh, and sorry, Jenny is also coming. <laughs>